My name is Wendell Griffin, and I am glad to welcome you to this place, the sanctuary of Lakeshore Drive Baptist Church, where Lakeshore Drive Baptist Church and New Millennium Church worship and share in the work of ministry. This year, we're glad to welcome you to uh, this lecture from our friend, Dr. Alan Buzak of South Africa, and we gladly are pleased that Dr. Buzak's wife, Dr. Elna Buzak, <coughs> has been able to join him on this visit. Uh, this is her second and his third time with us, and so they are not strangers to our fellowship. Let me ask you, as a matter of general housekeeping, to assist us in the following ways. If you, like I, have an electronic device that goes buzz, buzz, bing, bing, ding, ding, or some other audible sound, would you please place it in the silent, hush, be quiet, or off positions, so as to not distract from <coughs> Dr. Buzak's lecture, and so that your phone will not be recorded for imperpetuity, uh, imperpetuity, uh, because you know everything happens now in these kind of contexts that goes video record that goes to the web, uh, and so you don't want your phone and your image frantically finding your phone and seeing it around the world. <coughs> Secondly, in that same context, uh, we do video record uh, our sermons, our lectures, and so if you are here, please know that your uh, image is being uh, captured not for the purpose of sharing with Facebook uh, or the Russians, <laughs> <laughs> or that wonderfully famous group now that's been associated with a certain camp presidential campaign not to be named in this setting. <laughs> but uh, because we believe that the work of truth should be spread abroad. And so we do videotape and do all that shit that way. Uh, lastly, if you are here, you probably do not need a long introduction to Dr. Alan Buzak. You will therefore not be disappointed if I don't give you one. <laughs> if you need one, then you will do your phone and do the usual thing, which is Google or go to your search engine and find more than I would be able to tell you in any respect, some of which is untrue. Uh, I mean, this, that is true, you know. It's what true. you find on the internet is yeah. both unedited and also unvalidated. <laughs> yeah. Suffice it to say that Alan Audrey Buzak needs no preacher to commend him to any audience, and certainly not to an audience of justice loving, justice seeking people. It is my good blessing to have befriended him several years ago and to be the beneficiary of not only his friendship but also his counsel. Uh, I will make one shameless plug. When I was pondering my own worth as a preacher, it was Alan Buzak who told me in very Alan Buzak kind of ways, uh, to get about my business and stop navel gazing. Uh, he put it in better. Uh, and in that context, he was the person that I asked to uh, write the foreword to my first book, and I thank him for doing so. Today, he's going to speak with us about his latest work. He's written almost 20. I wish he would be industrious. Uh, Pharaohs on both sides of the Bloodwood Waters. I will not take any more of his time. What we'll do, he will talk for some 30 to 45 minutes. He will have 
a Q&A afterwards, then he'll sign books. Uh, and uh, after he gets through with his main lecture, then we'll have the Q&A and I'll basically moderate that part. Is that okay, brother? That's fine, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Wendell, and thank you, friends, for this uh, opportunity. It's always uh, a wonderful privilege to be back uh, here the New Millennium in Arkansas, Little Rock, uh, with its rich history. It's always wonderful to be back with Wendell and Pat and, and this congregation. And I'm, I'm so privileged to have all of you here this afternoon so that we can have uh, some conversation about this book. Wendell Griffin remains, uh, for me, uh, a great inspiration. Um, one of the things that we constantly worry about, I, I remember in a conversation with uh, people up at Rochester um, Divinity School with Dr. Um, Marvin McMickle, and I quoted a Pew study that said that the whole issue of prophetic preaching and prophetic witness and prophetic presence in American society that was the heartbeat of the black church for so long that we've almost come to take for granted that that has changed dramatically and that the study found that less than 25% of black churches were seriously engaged in prophetic faithfulness in society, that the whole emphasis in their preaching, in their witnessing in society had shifted. Um, and he was very upset about that, and we talked about that. He, but when I mentioned that study, he said to me, that study is outdated. He says, it's much worse than you think. He says, I have found in my conversations uh, with black churches across the country that is less than 10%. Um, so that's, that's very disturbing. And then to have somebody like Wendell Griffin and this church community trying to be faithful in these issues, and uh, whereas we all know it does not become easier, to the contrary, it is much harder um, for people to remain that faithful is for me a a wonderful, wonderful thing, and I praise God for that. Um, so it's, 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 it's just a privilege to be here with you, Wendell and Pat and, and this church, and with you, friends, this afternoon. <clears throat> now, um, I don't know why he keeps on talking about a lecture, um, because we're not going to have that lecture. I'll, I'll talk a bit about the book. Um, and I don't think that I will go on for 40 minutes or so, um, because I really do want to leave more time for conversation, uh, which is much, much, much better than you just sitting here listening um, to me. The book is called Pharaohs on Both Sides of the Blood Red Waters. It's a long title, and it also has a subtitle. Prophetic Critique on Empire, Resistance, Justice, and the Power of the Hopeful Seas Were, a Transatlantic Conversation. Now, my daughter <coughs> looked at this book and said, Dad, what is the matter with you? Why don't you just give the book a title? You don't have to have a title, and then a subtitle, and then a sub-sub-subtitle, and then something to round off the sub-sub-subtitle. Just say it. And she always complains that I never know that I can actually say the same thing in 50 words instead of 500 words. So, so this is the title, The Pharaohs on Both Sides of the Blood Red Waters, Prophetic Critique on Empire, that's a subtitle. Resistance, Justice, and the Power of the Hopeful Susan, that's a sub sub subtitle. And then the Transatlantic Conversation um, ends it off. But, all of it is necessary. 
because I was determined to really have a conversation from across the waters. The United States, South Africa, and Palestine are the three places of reference in this book. I also wanted to call it this a transatlantic conversation because I began with this conversation in 2011 with young people um, in South Africa on three university campuses and in the black townships. And we were talking about, now this was 2011, so Mandela was still alive, uh, but, but Thabo Mbeki uh, was uh, the president and had been deposed, so to speak, recalled by the ANC, and Jacob Zuma had just become the president, and we uh, lost him along the way about a month ago. Praise God, these things still happen. You guys have a, a, a bit longer to go. We've lost, we've lost Jacob Zuma, told him to go find um, a place where he can retire. And, um, but, but the students and the young people were very engaged. We talked about South African politics. We talked about the nature of politics. We talked about reconciliation. We talked about their anger that the reconciliation process in South Africa that was started with so much promise um, and so much uh, hopefulness, that that reconciliation process uh, was stuttering, to say the least. Um, now, a few years later, when I spoke to students last year in South Africa, they were ready to call the reconciliation process not just a mistake, but a fraud that they feel was perpetrated upon their generation. So you see how quickly things have changed. Um, that was the time <clears throat> when the students were talking 2011, were beginning to raise issues by 2015. Those same students were on the streets um, protesting. And at the heart, they call it fees must fall, fees for university tuition. And for them, the fee situation was a symbol and almost encapsulated the whole problem of South Africa in terms of our socioeconomic inequalities. Because after 1994, South Africa had become one, a, a nation with the greatest gap between rich and poor in our part of the world. Um, in the developing world, it is Great Britain and the United States that has the greatest gaps. But we have surpassed Brazil at that point. And even today, we have a small elite. We have the white people who've always been rich and they've kept those, that position. And we can talk about that later. We have a very small elite of blacks which were drawn into the system. And we have the vast majority of people, um, something like 63%, who live in desperate poverty. Now, the students were saying, the fact that we have to battle to get a decent education after almost 25 years is symbolic of the way in which things had been going and of the inequalities that now have settled. And it's true that, look at it from one way, the gap between the rich and the poor in South Africa today is much larger than it ever was under apartheid. And, and, and some Peter Blanche, one of our most respected economists, have, has worked out, he's died two months ago, has worked out that white people who were rich through apartheid before 1994, in the first 15 years, now after our transition into a democracy, became 10 times richer than they were in the 30 years before 1994. Now, those are frightening things you begin to ask. What does that mean for people every single day? So those conversations about those things were those students. And then I got uh, an opportunity to visit uh, Israel uh, for once, and they told me I would not be allowed back again, but had a wonderful conversation with those young people. Um, uh, 
in the occupied East Bank, West Bank, sorry, and, um, and in uh, Bethlehem and places like that. And then coming here uh, while teaching at Christian Theological Seminary and Butler University, had opportunities to have uh, very wonderful and enriching conversations with the young people from Black Lives Matter. So out of all those conversations, um, this book was uh, born. And, and you will find that uh, if you read through the book all the time. So it's a conversation um, across the Atlantic. Because I believe that all these young people are involved in a struggle. And it's not, it's a new struggle for many of them. But in many ways, these are renewed struggles. These are all battles we have fought before. It's not battles peculiar to this generation. All of you here, if you are here today, that tells me where your mind and your heart are on these justice issues. We fought those battles. There was a, such a thing as a civil rights struggle. There was such a thing as an anti-apartheid struggle. There were people who made immense sacrifices over these many years. We have a legacy that we thought we had left behind for this generation. And this generation are turning around and saying to us, what is it that you think you have been doing? Why have you betrayed us? is the word that they use. Why did you think that when some of you got to a position where you were put in positions of power, when some of you began to make a little money, you thought we had all arrived, you thought it was all over, and you told us we have now reached this point, we are great, we have done. But our situation has not changed. Why is it that we are battling with these things? And, and why is it that you don't understand when we're trying to tell you this? And so I heard that conversation. Um, and this book is trying to engage these young people. I also engage with them because I do believe that this is a new struggle. I also believe it's a global struggle, I've said. And so all these things are connected. I think it's a mistake if we think in the United States, the struggles we are fighting here is just about us. Or in South Africa, or in Palestine, it's just about us. Or in the Middle East in general. It's not just about us. This is a global struggle because empire is global. And that's the reality that we are facing. And unless we understand that, we are going to be splintered and divided and our energy is going to be sucked up by little things here and there and there. And if we do not realize, are there ways that we can come together so that we can make this a better way of struggling and going forward? So those are the things I also believe that these are not just struggles. I speak of it as a, as a new revolution. See that I, there's, a, there's a, a, an Iranian scholar who teaches at Columbia who says it is about time that we revise our thinking about what a revolution is. A revolution can no longer be described in the way that we describe the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the Cuban Revolution. So um, in one go, so to speak, and within a set period of time, the old order is smashed and changed and a new order is established. He says that does not happen anymore because the nature of our societies, the nature of, of, of empire has changed so drastically. And so he says we need to think of revolutions as an ongoing, open-ended process. And, and so our our expectations is not that tomorrow everything will be changed, but our expectation is that if we keep on fighting today and tomorrow, that at the end of tomorrow, some things will have changed, even if only in our own minds. And what changes in our minds is absolutely necessary for what needs to be changed tomorrow in the structures of society. I agree with that. And so I constantly say to the students, don't set yourself short-term goals set short-term goals within certain parameters, and don't run away from thinking about what you're doing. And there I fall back on my own experiences. When the youth in South Africa took over uh, the struggle in 1976, and it became, in effect, a youth revolution. 
And I think all of the revolutions that we're having in our world today are youth revolutions. And they are led by the young people. It is to our detriment that we deny that. And there's a problem because whereas in 1976 it was quite natural for us to turn to seek allies in the churches, in 2017, 2018, it is no longer natural for the young people to turn to the churches. They don't think we are their allies. So, and because we have disappointed them so much. So that's our next step. There's a revolution going on, but we find ourselves on the fringes. I was uh, in a panel discussion the other day with, um, with two icons of the civil rights struggle in this country. And we were talking about what was happening today. And there was a young person who represented Black Lives Matter. And she was trying to say, to raise some questions from these respected icons around the table. And this one guy was a great, wonderful guy with a wonderful history in the struggle, just could not understand it. He kept on saying to her, well, how can I take you seriously? No. He says, did you go and vote? No, she says. He says, how can I take you seriously if you don't even vote? Do you work for the Democratic Party? Well, she says, no, but you know, the problem is, I wasn't sure whether it is worth voting anyway. I first need to make out what am I voting for? Because, he says, your system that you now recommend, to, in our eyes, is totally corrupt. So, so what has that system done for us? It is not doing anything right now. All of the difficulties that we're facing now, and she mentioned all of the things and the killings and all of that and the opportunities for, for young black people that are no longer, he says, that's under your watch. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that if I voted for one or another person, it would have changed. I'm looking for ways in which the system as a whole could be changed. And I remember when my wife and I had our first conversation, with uh, the Black Lives Matter folk in Ferguson, uh, they, they, they gave us a, a t-shirt that says the whole damn system <laughs> has to go, or something like that. So, so and, and that's what, and this fellow, and he's a great man, he just could not understand it. She says, your system is too corrupt. Tell me what you're doing about that system before you ask me whether I'm going to vote. And so, but I could see that conversation going like this. Um, it's not all of it uh, where we, we, we miss out as, as churches because there's also in Ferguson the example of uh, a young UCC minister by the name of Starsky Wilson, whom I quote in this book, uh, who from the very beginning has made such an impression on these young people that they, this is, there's a quote in this book where this young woman says, uh, I had given up believing in God and in the church until she met Sasuke Wilson. Mm -hmm. And the way he acted and the way he brought out his message, the way he preached, the way he was with them in the streets, confronting the police, praying in the streets with them, and then going to jail with them, and then when he got out raising bail for the kids still in the jail, all of those things. Uh, I mean, by the time she got to know him a little bit, she is a member of the church now. She's changed. She says, they made me believe I could see Jesus. And it's, there's some wonderful quotes from her um, in this book. Um, and so we don't have to be as lost as we are. We don't have to be the disappointment that we mostly are today. But we have to look in the mirror. And looking in the mirror is looking at Jesus and say, my God, Jesus, what have we done with you? Mm. If you see what I'm saying. So when it begins there, then there are all sorts of openings for the church. So that's, and so this book tries to follow that conversation. The title, Pharaohs on Both Sides of the Blood Red Waters, is a quote 
from a black Presbyterian minister, Henry Highland Garnet, from 1843, who was speaking to a conference of black folk in Buffalo, New York, and it was called an address to the slaves, to the African slaves in the United States. It's a fiery address. Um, he says a number of things. He says slavery is a grave sin, and white people, slave owners, will have to pay for that sin. He says, before God, there is no excuse for this sin. Then he says, but there is an even greater sin than slavery. And he says, that is submission to slavery. He says, the fact that you just accept that slavery is okay and that it goes on, that you do not rise up against it, that's a greater sin against God because that is not what God made you for. Then he goes on to say, and you'd better understand that not only is slavery a great sin, not rising up against slavery is a sin because it is your duty. He says you offend God if you do not rise up against slavery. Then he makes a fourth point. And he says, and you'd better be sure that slavery is economically so important to the slave owner society in which we live that they're not going to let you go. He yeah. says, you're going to have to fight for it. And if you're not prepared for bloodshed, because without bloodshed, I don't see anything happening, then you better forget about it. He says, so not, not, not just standing up and saying it is wrong. He says, fight for your freedom. Be willing to die for your freedom. Now, that's a clear call to violence. Um, and that became, I think, the reason why that speech got skewed a little bit, because um, um, the debate at the conference and afterwards, all about the call to violence, should we, the oppressed people, rise up and when does it help, and violence and nonviolence, all of that. Um, and we miss the next important thing that he says, which is the fifth point that Henry Highland Garnet makes. He says, and I know some of you think you can run away. But he says, forget about it. Because slavery is everywhere. Yeah. That was the time when the United States was attacking Mexico and appropriating Mexican land all, all over the show. And he says, if you run to the islands where the British are, there slavery is there. If you run down to South America, slavery is there. If you think you can go to Mexico, he, the, the way he said it, and this is a quote, these people are taking Mexico, and they will take the black flag of slavery with them. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter where it's big. And in that context, he says, remember that there are pharaohs on both sides of the blood red waters. That's where the quote comes from. I appropriate that quote because I say, well, the Exodus paradigm is so at the heart of our struggles. And let my people go is a slogan, and in sermons, and in songs, it doesn't matter where you look, uh, in, in black communities, and in black uh, church communities, Christian communities, Exodus, and, 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 and the Red Sea, that's, that's, those are powerful symbols. Um, and I say, that's true though, so if Pharaohs are on both sides of these blood red waters, I say, we have had our struggles, and we thought that with the end of the civil rights struggle, we have crossed the Red Sea. Martin King was talking about the mountaintop. I can see the promised land. The Red Sea is behind us. The promised land is just ahead of us. Now we know what he's talking about, but we don't know what he's talking about because we've never been there. Mm. And how come we've never reached that? Same is true. Almost literally, my wife and I were driving between Johannesburg and Cape Town, and this was 19, towards the end of the 1990s. And uh, in a place where we stopped to put uh, petrol in a car, there was an old man who recognized us and came to me and talked to me. And he said, he used the term, he said to me, Dr. Pusak, when will we, talking about the people left behind, the poor rural people, 
When will we cross the Red Sea? He says, as far as we're concerned, you guys are all over on the other side. We are rejoicing. Because you're in government, you're this, you have money, you're not this, and that. We are still on this side of the Red Sea. We're still in Egypt. So I keep that image in mind. But the image got so I know. Uh, you guys have crossed this Red Sea of the civil rights struggle, but according to the young people, we're still on this side. Or put another way, when we crossed the side, we found, oh, there's another pharaoh. Yeah. <laughs> we crossed 1994, we find there's another pharaoh. But here's the thing, and I quote my friend Tukatsu Mofrakeng, because when we talked about this 2015, I was talking about what's going on in my head about this book. He said to me, but Alan, that's a wonderful image, but you know, what if the pharaoh looks like us? Yeah. And that became the theme that I keep on returning to in the book. So we have a pharaoh. We know that now. The oppression in many ways has not changed. A black face in office in South Africa, we have found, does not mean you have the guarantee for justice and dignity for our people. Amen. We can sell out as easily when we are in power as when we are seeking power. So getting sentimental about our politics, and that's another thing that I learned from the young people, a young woman, student on Port Elizabeth campus said to me, Dr. Busa, what if I told you that we are done with the politics of sentiment? By which she meant, just because Nelson Mandela is a great name that carries great symbolic value, and he, my, my father swears by him, why should I vote for him if I'm not sure that he's doing something for me, that changes the country. That is the politics of sentiment. We're done with that, she says. So when the pharaoh looks like you, it changes everything, but what do you then do? So in this book, we try to work with that. And I go back and forth to the lessons that we have learned. Um, and there is uh, there's this one thing that I discovered, which is very, very pertinent. We have, we have discovered in South Africa, and I guess here as well, been outmaneuvered. In, in, in a way, the reason why we haven't reached all our goals is because we have been outmaneuvered by democracy. Hmm. This is what I mean. So we were told, you are now in a democracy, and because you are now in a democracy, the rules have changed. When we reached 1994 and Mandela was voted in and we marched in the streets, not in protest but in joy, one of the first things that we were told, notably by white liberal theologians, was that, why are you still talking about liberation theology? That's done now. I mean, you people are free now, isn't it? So you got to think differently about theology. Busak, stop talking about liberation. So, well, you know, as long as people are oppressed and as long as people are kept in desperate poverty and as long as people do not experience justice in their lives, liberation is going to be our theme. And by the way, you can't change the message of the Bible just because your political situation has changed. It remains the same. That means that you don't look at yourself. I'm not going to look at myself as a privileged theologian. I'm going to ask the question, what about the people, the seas were? That's the name that I use here. It's a Zulu word, a Nguni word, actually, for, for the people, the seas were. And I took that from, um, from a lovely hymn that we turned into a freedom song, which is what we always seem to do. We take our hymns and we turn them into freedom songs. Um, and, 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 and Tula Sizwe, Tula Sizwe is the name of that song. And it means, be, be quiet, my people. Don't cry anymore because God has hurt you. God is with us. God will walk with us. Tula Sizwe, Tula Sizwe. I use that word because I don't want to use the word nation so much. Um, nationalism has become a very discomforting word for me. 
And I think we need to move away. For me, talking about the people is, is inclusive. It's strong. It's not as if we have to be defined in terms of our nationhood, but our humanity. So when I look at you, I see not just God's people, I see my people. Amen. Because we're standing in the same tradition of resistance and hopefulness. And I have found, and that's another book that we discussed the last time that I was here, Dare We Speak of Hope, I said that one of the things that we must do is we must stop investing our hopes in politics and in politicians. But we must keep our hope in the people, in their hopefulness, and in their resilience, because that's the wonderful thing of our people that I have found in, in South Africa. Um, and you draw your courage from them and from the sacrifices that they have made and are willing to make even now. And the young people, and that's where we come together. I say to the young people, where do you, I mean, you do all of this today. You see the strategies that you are following. You think that fell out of thin air? No, I tell them, that's the exact same strategies we used in the 1980s. And we look to the 1950s, Albert Lutuli and the ANC civil disobedient campaigns then to find those strategies work then. And that's why we are. So there is something in the river that flows among us. Um, and into that river we deposit this hope and it never dries up, even if that river is filled by the tears of our people. Um, that's the wells uh, that, we, that we draw from. And so, outmaneuvered by democracy, and I have two examples, South Africa and the United States, probably Palestine as well. But in 1966, now I'm almost done. In 1966, um, Martin Luther King came to Chicago. And Chicago became, thank you, Joyce. Chicago became Martin's failure, everybody says, because um, he ran into Richard Daly. I talk about that in the book. Martin King did not go to Chicago to go and fight for voting rights. By the time he got to Chicago, black folk in Chicago had had the right to vote for 100 years. He went to challenge their discrimination in terms of housing and education and those issues. When he got to Chicago, he met with Daly, but Daly had with him six black councilmen whose job it was to convince Martin Luther King that Daly was a decent politician with whom one could talk, whose word one could take, because they were working with him all the time. What Martin did not know is that those politicians were called the silent six because they fit in so neatly with all Daly's plans. They never challenged him. They worked well within the empire that he had built, and they were richly rewarded. So they were no longer representing the oppressed communities. They were simply doing Daly's will. And by that, they secured for themselves all these positions of power. And they got enough pork to do things in their communities, but they never, liberation was never the goal. Changing the system was never the goal. Responding to Martin King and to the demands of the community that he had taken to them was never the goal. But they were democratically elected. Democracy placed them there. So for me, and I have four lessons in this book that I draw from that thing. And one of the lessons is, what do we do with the vote that we finally won? In whom do we invest that power? Because it's our power that we now entrust to politicians so that they can do what is right for the people. What happens? That's democracy. But what kind of democracy are we talking about? Do we, do we profit, in the right sense of the word, from that democracy? Is democracy there then to take the people to the next level of our liberation? And in Chicago, Martin King was totally outmaneuvered because um, what Daly did and what they said to him, look, you don't need all these marches. This is not the South. 
I'm not going to send my police out to you. You know, this is, I'm not Bull Connor. So why don't we make some agreements? Okay, you do. You don't. Number one, you don't have to march so much. Number two, you don't need all that many people. Why don't we limit the numbers of people? That's the agreement. Then limit the number of people. In, cha- in exchange, I will give you scattered housing. I will do this. I will do that. I will do that. Handshake. Well, of course, Martin was not going to ask for a contract or a political memorandum of understanding or an agreement, whatever it is you call these things that they sign at the UN. But, but he took daily at his word because the word was given in the presence of black folk like him. He did not at that point understood quite as well what happens to black folk when we are democratically elected but forget our principles. Hello. So, when Martin left, he made a statement, which he says, Chicago was great, we have this understanding. By the time he landed in Atlanta, Daly had put out another statement, said, no, that was just a gentleman's agreement. I don't feel myself bound to anything. So Martin lost. And everybody talks about how the movement lost. It was not the movement. It was not the movement. The movement lost because those black folk in key positions of power decided to betray the movement. And Martin, as bright as he was, was still growing politically. He was was in his process of radicalization, but he was not yet at the end of 1966 and the beginning of 1967, where he began to think totally different about American democracy. Vincent Harding says that after Chicago, Martin began to see the reality of politics, not in the South and not just in the North, but how America responds. And he learned that lesson. And so the final lesson I thought was when Martin King saw what was happening to him, he did not go sit in a corner and sulk. He did not get angry simply at himself or got angry at Daly and shouted at Daly. He didn't use 10 speeches to denounce Daly. Martin King saw, oh, oh, so this is what you do. I have got to change my strategies. I'm going to rethink. He radicalized, Vincent Harding says. That's when he began to talk also about calling upon all the creative dissenters to begin to do things in American society. Out of those experiences, you would hear beyond Vietnam on 4th of April, 1967. Out of those experiences, you will have the, uh, the lectures on the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, which was brought together in the book Trumpet of Hope. All of those things made of Martin what he, he learned from it. And I say, when we say we have been outmaneuvered in, by democracy, both here and in South Africa, don't go sit in a corner and sulk. Don't go shout at the ANC. Think about how do we deal with the situation, and that's what the young people are doing. So, but the book is about hope. As always, I am hopelessly caught by hope. As now, although my friend Miguel de la Torre says he's writing a book in which he says to Christians, scratch the word hope altogether, because it makes you complacent. It makes you think everything is okay. It makes you think, okay, it's all right. As long as I hope in God, everything will be fine. He said, forget about it. And I say to him, but Miguel, if we say scratch hope, you really have to scratch God as well. Yeah. I can't do that. So I've got to ask myself the question, how do I retain a hope that is not only resilient but radical? Not only radical but revolutionary. Not only revolutionary, but real. Uh, And that's what we try to say um, in this book. Um, And I hope that when you read it, um, you will find some of the stuff that I've been trying to tell, tell you today. Thank you so much for listening. We can have a conversation.
Dr. Buzek and I have agreed that I will put the first question on the floor. He'll begin to engage. And if you have some other questions, then raise your hands and I'll recognize you. We'll carry it on the conversation from there. I have the benefit of having visited with the book for a while, and so uh, I've gotten a little bit of a preview. Dr. Buzak, in your book, you shed some new light on that African term that we have heard, Ubuntu. Yes. And you have, if I may say, radicalized uh, Ubuntu and the <coughs> sentimentalized, sentimentalized Ubuntu. Would you speak to that a minute? Yes. Um, one of the things that I have returned to constantly in the last three publications um, is our reconciliation process because it is so important to us. And because reconciliation is so important for Christians, it is, uh, it is the thing that the Bible tells us that is not an option for us, as if there are other options, as if we can look at it and say, well, you know, it might work here, but it can't work here because of this and that. The Bible simply says we are, we are Christ's ambassadors for reconciliation. That's our calling. That's our ministry. We can't escape it. So the question is not how do we maneuver ourselves around reconciliation. The question is how do we respond to this calling. So I re keep on returning to that. And all, also because it is so important politically, reconciliation. And you run into it just about everywhere. All situations and countries um, where there is conflict and whether it is the open war conflict that you have in places like Syria or Yemen or the simmering conflict and tensions and hostility that you have in the United States, before it boils over into violence, which it sometimes does, before you have all of that, you, you, everybody talks about reconciliation. How, when this is over, how do we bring people together if you are still interested in living in one country and building one society together with a semblance of justice and dignity and equality? Um, so reconciliation is important. But in our reconciliation process, the word Ubuntu had become a very key word for us. Ubuntu is an age-old African philosophy connected with African religion and African way of life and African law, um, some people even argue. And it, it, at its heart, it says, my humanity is caught up in your humanity. I cannot be human unless you are human. And that depends on me, how human you are, in the sense of how I treat you. So if I diminish you in any way whatsoever, I diminish myself. My humanity is undermined if I undermine your humanity. So it calls for human relationships. It seeks wholeness. It looks at, 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 at community in a way that is typically African. But it also has been used in our reconciliation process, especially by Archbishop Desmond Tutu. And I talk about that in this book, how the world actually came to know the word Ubuntu through Desmond Tutu. And that makes a difference. Because they did not hear the word from some African philosopher, scholar, or some legal person who would explain to them in legal terms what that meant. But they heard it from one of the most devoted Christians that is walking around on God's earth still today. And for him, Ubuntu was immediately connected to forgiveness. And he says people in, and because he says, when the world began to hear what was happening in apartheid with those hearings, they were astounded. But even more astounding, was the fact that these black people who were the victims of such oppression for more than three and a half centuries 
was so willing and able and ready, those are the words he uses, to forgive. And he says it's because of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu became this key thing for us. You, if you're black and you have this African tradition, if you're confronted with this huge injustice, this white policeman who tortured you, then Ubuntu, if not Jesus, Ubuntu would bring you to the point of saying, I forgive you. Even though that policeman may not even ask for forgiveness. That's how it went. And so I had to ask the question, what, what is it that this Ubuntu is doing? Can we even use Ubuntu in a situation like ours? And so I try to, I try to explore that term. And I come to the conclusion that Ubuntu is a wonderful concept and it is a way of life um, for, for those of us who are African and who value human community and human relationships. But is it adequate for what is needed in our situation today? Is it adequate in a situation where we are asked to deal with a horrific, violent, tragic past? Um, is, it, is, it, is it right that I must forgive you because of Ubuntu? And you're not, you're not even... Ubuntu means nothing to you. But, you. but you exploit my loyalty to Ubuntu to get you off the hook. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just talking about saying I'm sorry. I'm not even talking about saying please forgive him because there's a, there's a difference there. I mean, you can begin with remorse, which is saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I really, I'm, oh, I'm torn up inside because of what I did to you. Then you have to move to repentance. And remorse and repentance is not the same thing because repentance is the turning of that remorse into actions of the dismantling of injustice and the building of justice. That's repentance. Your pastor did a wonderful lecture um, two years ago in which he talks about the meaning of repentance when he spoke to that Baptist school. Um, and then... Where after remorse and repentance, there's not Ubuntu, there's restitution. Yeah. Because then I have to return to you what I have taken from you. And of course, we Africans think about the land that was taken away from us. But we also think of the dignity that was taken away. How do we restore that? So if reconciliation is the restoration of justice and dignity and equality, what does that mean? And so if you put that within, Ubuntu doesn't deal with that. So if Ubuntu is only concerned, is the second point, with human relationships and that you and I should feel good with one another, what does that mean? Because Ubuntu has no way of dealing with systems of oppression. One of the problems that our reconciliation process threw up was what a, an African scholar by the name of um, Mamdani, brilliant, brilliant man, he said, South Africa's reconciliation process made the mistake of dealing with what he called fractured elites. He means this. He says, you act as if the whole apartheid criminal system, because that's what apartheid was. People mustn't forget this. It wasn't just a system. It was of, 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 of segregation. It was declared a crime against humanity. In the 20th century, there were only two political systems. A war crime is something different. A war crime, one single soldier can do to another person or to a group of people or a platoon like Mi Lai, whose 50th we just commemorated the other day. That's a war crime. What Milosevic did as a war crime. 
But the crime against, so, so it can be individualized, but a crime against humanity by its very nature is how oppression and exploitation and hurt and damage has been systematized into a system. The two systems that were condemned like that was Nazism and apartheid. That's the two systems in the 20th century. There might be some more coming up in this century. And I think the way we're going, we're going to pile them up. So, so I, then you have to ask the question, he says, if it's about a system, and so the crime, the definition of a crime against humanity that was adopted by the international community in Rome in 1960 under the auspices of the United Nations is that not only is it the crime that is being perpetrated against a group of people as a whole, it is also those, because it's systematic, remember, it's also those who systematically benefits from that crime. So in that sense, it is not only the policeman who tortures her, who is the criminal against humanity. It's also all of the white community who profits from that situation that is now in the dock. Um, Ubuntu doesn't deal with that. So Mamdani says, so what you end up with is you end up with individualized crimes. Me, one perpetrator, one policeman, and her as the one victim. So if the two of us speak, and I get her to tell me through Ubuntu, oh, don't worry about it, Colonel, or whoever I was. I forgive you. Then I walk away. It's all right. But what happens to the systems of oppression? Apartheid wasn't just about torture or killing. And actually, that has an impact on your definition of violence. So was violence only the physical violence, which our Truth and Reconciliation Commission dealt with only with physical violence. So in as much as I crippled you, in as much as I tortured you, in as much as I did physical things, that's physical. That is what they were talking about. They're not even close to the psychological damage that that torture did to me. They're not even close to the other forms of violence, like taking away my home, stealing my land, giving my children an education that was not nearly adequate to the challenges that we face. All of those things are forms of violence. And if you concentrate on only one thing, and it's only an individual, what, what is it that we're talking about? And that cannot be saved by Ubuntu. If Ubuntu cannot address systemic violence and structural exploitation, what good does it do? So those are the questions. So I'm saying that Ubuntu needs some biblical injection. It needs to understand the justice that the Bible is talking about. So distributive justice is biblical justice. The justice that restores. And we come back time and time again to my favorite story, and far, as far as that's concerned in the Bible, is the story of Zacchaeus. Um, and as I told you this two years ago, but so I, I spoke in 2012 or 11 somewhere, and I said, uh, the problem with us in South Africa, one of the problems with us in South Africa is that white Christians uh, love Mandela much more than they love Jesus. Woo! <laughs> you should have seen that. I mean, I had, it, 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 I must say, it caught me totally by surprise. I was not at all aware that white people would take that so seriously. I had to explain to newspapers, on the radio, and things, what, what is it that I meant? And I said, well, you know, if you go to Mandela, what Mandela will say to you, white folks, is, oh, you know what, it's okay. We black people will take upon ourselves this burden of forgiving you. Um, and it's all right, you don't have to give back anything. Uh, uh, you can keep your land, you can keep the money, all of that that you've stolen from us is fine because we need to build a democratic society. And Mandela will have to say that with the World Bank in mind, with the US government in mind, and with all of those things in mind. You know, Jesus didn't think of the World Bank. 
Well, Zacchaeus, Jesus will tell you not to think of what, of what the IMF will say. Jesus will say to you, oh, you remember what happened between me and Zacchaeus? Go read in the Bible. And you see what Zacchaeus did? Well, he gave back what he stole, not just like this, but fourfold. And then he gave back everything that he had in order to give to the poor. And then he confessed before Jesus and the crowd. He didn't think, oh, uh, this is a thing between me and Jesus only. Like David, when we love that psalm, all of us. Psalm 51, you remember? Gorgeous psalm. I mean, when we read that in the, in the common confession in the church, everybody feels before you and you alone. But that's not true, is it? David did not sin before God and God alone. What about Bathsheba? And what about her husband? Why doesn't he count them? Didn't he sin against them? And why is it, is it, why is it that God counts and they don't? And why does he think when God counts, God will be happy if they don't count? So it's, these are the questions. Um, and we say, don't hide behind Ubuntu. Let's make sure that Ubuntu means the restoration of justice and, and inequality and all of the indignity and all of those things. And so Ubuntu is a, is a less sentimentalized concept. I don't throw it away. I say, no, let's fill Ubuntu with biblical justice. And then we can begin to have a different kind of conversation. But it's also one of those things. I mean, South Africans, as long as almost as if as long as we can go around and say Ubuntu, 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 <laughs> Ubuntu, 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 everything is fine. If you talk to me, so what did you do to me, Ubuntu? <laughs> if I say to you, where's my land, Ubuntu? <laughs> You're not going to get away with that, not anymore, and it's not right. Um, because these things are too precious to be abused like this. I would not have you talk on the subject of justice on Holy Saturday without asking you to put into context, in the context of Holy Saturday, the experience of Stefan Frost. Yeah. And Jesus. And the whole issue of how we are to think about the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And you and I have talked about this, but I want to just ask you to be uh, kind enough to talk about it in a larger context. Well, um, you raised it in uh, that blog that you've written, how significant it is that in these days that we are thinking of the death of Jesus and the crucifixion, we will also be thinking of the assassination of Martin Luther King. And we will have to continue to think of the assassination of Stephen Clark. And not just about the fact that he's dead or that he has been shot, but that he has been shot 20 times. I read this morning um, that he was also shot in the back, so he was trying to run away. It's like in the Sharpville massacre when there was a, a march um, a non-violent protest march against the past laws in Sharpville, just south of Johannesburg, in South Africa on March 21st. And the police opened fire um, and, and killed 68 people, uh, most of them shot in the back as they were running um, away. And in these days, um, 770 people wounded in Palestine, um, 17 dead, um, uh, one of them a young artist um, whose sculpture was still standing on the sand, was 22 years old, 
and the sculpture was still standing on the sand, and the sculpture was called, We Are Returning. Because the march was about going back and commemorating their ancient homes from which they had been driven in the Nakba of 70 years ago. Um, so all these things, and that is how close to that holy place? And for us as Christians on, on, on Holy Saturday, those are the things that we need to connect in our minds and in our hearts and in our prayers and in our meditation and in our work and in our vision and in our way of seeing one another and the work that we need to do. And it's, 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 it's highly improper. I, I know that we, we do that almost instinctively for all sorts of reasons. But as much as we make of Good Friday, Christians are most impatient with Good Friday. And we don't even want to talk about Holy Saturday. We, 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 we hardly begin to talk about, as soon as we are done with the blood on Friday, we rush towards Sunday. We don't want to think anymore. But I mean, Jesus was on that cross, and he was taken off that cross and laid in a grave for dead. And so that Friday night is not just the uncertainty of what now, it's the absolute certainty that whatever he has come to do on this earth and try it has failed. The Roman Empire was triumphant on Friday. And on Saturday they were still growing with their collaborators in the temple elite because they have actually succeeded in stopping this upstart. For one moment, he thought he was actually going to change this world and take away from us our power, but thank God, he's dead. And we saw him die. We heard him say, my God, my God. We heard him say, it is finished. And now we think, yes, you are finished. That's what. Yeah. And so on Saturday, we are all in this tomb. And we mustn't be too much in a hurry. Don't get suffocated. Don't. What's that thing, that phobia that you get? Claustrophobia. You see, I've got to keep you awake. Don't get claustrophobic on Jesus. You've got to find the endurance to stay in that tomb and live with the darkness. Don't run away from Stephen because you can't run away from Jesus. There's a reason why James Cone wrote that book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. And it's a reason why I find that probably his best work and the reason he writes so passionately about that. And when he wrote that, it was, it was almost exclusively in response to Trayvon Martin, right? Mm -hmm. Look, where are we today? Uh, we used to mention all the names. Have we counted in the last six months? No, we haven't. Because it's too dark in that tomb. Counting the names knowing the names, saying the names, that's, that's being in the tomb. Thinking about what it means when Laquan was shot 14 times, that's staying in the tomb. Thinking what it means to be shot 20 times, that's staying in the tomb. Thinking about how easily these things have been dismissed by the courts. I was reading on the way here yesterday in preparation for a class on Monday, I was reading about lynching in the United States. And I must say, I mean, I've, I've known you guys ever since 1973, and I've had these intimate relationship built up with, with folk in the US. So the question of lynching is not, is not strange to me. But you know, I'm getting goosebumps. If you read, in, there's a book 
that, that, that Colleen Murphy uh, that I'm teaching with. And she took this one chapter and it's, it's, it's almost a moment by moment description of what happened to this young man, Hos. Uh, and I think, oh. But, but that is Saturday, Holy Saturday reading. You, you, you sit down and read that and, and be with that young man as she describes what they did to him. And the, and the gleeful, unholy joy of the crowd as, the, as, as they pile on the fire and as they begin to cut off the man who begins, and she describes the man who begins to cut off his ear. And once they did that, how all the others then got, how they cut off his fingers one by one by one by one. And how when they finally took off his genitals and showed it to the, the roar of the crowd. I mean, that's... But that's, that's Holy Saturday. That's staying in the tomb. That's staying in the tomb. That's, that's taking us away from the sentimentalized Jesus. So when we next sing about the blood that has all that power, I mean, it's one of the be- most, that, that's one of the black church's most beautiful, beautiful songs. I mean, I cry everything, and, and I sing with everybody, even though I know it's not just that. And there's so much else besides, but that's, so, so the endurance to have the patience, to have the love for Jesus, to stay with Jesus, not, not on Sunday morning when everybody is crying hallelujah, but in the loneliness of that tomb. That's where our love for Jesus is tested over this weekend. Not even, I mean, the cross is the one thing, but then to go, then we will know what it means when Sunday morning happens. But we must not be impatient with Holy Saturday. And we must make time on Holy Saturday. And we must think about these things on Holy Saturday and and find a way for the church to go. There's a reason why the old church traditions um, have the church all darkened on, on Holy Saturday. Maybe one candle. Uh, but that's it. That's it. Um, I remember how long it took me to explain this to my congregation when we began to change our liturgies and the way we do things way back in Belleville in 1985 uh, when we started thinking about... And we even had the thing that we inherited from the white Dutch Reform Church that makes no sense whatsoever, that you had your communion service on, you had nothing in Holy Week, but you had your communion service on Good Friday morning. And I said, guys, I mean, we can read the Bible for ourselves. We can see when it happened. So we changed that, but it took us a while to make sure that everybody understands. But of course, then I did not know what I knew now. Um, and the, the, these, these, these five years in the U.S. where all these killings had been going on, all these modern lynchings and, 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 and the war, the unending war in the Middle East and in Yemen, and that's, that's where we... I mean, we probably should just come together and just... We don't know all the names, even, of people here, but just to, just to mention all the countries just to think of all the children. Um, somewhere in this book, I quote the names of the kids who had been killed on the day that Donald Trump took his oath of office. When he gave that instruction for that attack. The mother of all you talked about? No, no, I'm talking about that first, that first attack in Yemen. The first attack in Yemen on that village. Um, let me just see. That's the first attack in Yemen. I first thought it was a drone strike, but it wasn't. It was, it was a special forces attack um, on, on, yeah, it was a f- special forces attack on that village in Yemen. And uh, the kids from three months to 12 years old uh, were all killed, and I wrote down the names in the book because I thought it's important that we that we know the names, not just the children. Of course, by now, 
it's thousands. Um, and the blockade is still there. And uh, young Mohammed bin Salman spots across the world, is fated in London and in Washington, D.C., because those kids and their parents and their hunger and their death don't matter. That's why I keep on saying to the young people, don't black lives matter here, but think of the other lives that matter too. And that brings you all together. This is one, the same people who are killing you here are the people who are killing you over there. And that's the insight that, 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 that they do have, because Ainsley Pullen, and I quote her in this book, tells Mr. Obama so when she refused to go to the White House at his invitations. I respectfully decline, but these are the reasons why, Mr. President. Powerful stuff. That's what we have to learn, because I always think, us pastors, now when the phone rings, and it is an invitation from the president, you say yes, whatever you have on your calendar. And if somebody dies on that day, well, hard luck. They can wait until tomorrow when I come back from, from the president. That's what we do. That's, that's, that's because it's so precious to us, that connection with high places and with power. Um, but I would love to be able to continue this conversation for a long period of time. I have one last question. <laughs> Yes. Poet is a poem, poet is a poet, great poet. And, and the thing that, that is always resonating with me in that is everything you have described is a tear. Every person you have described in the thing is a tear that breaks our heart. And in the darkness of the tomb, it is drop, drop, drop. Yes. Tear, tear, tear. And the great poem says that it's through the tears. Against our resistance, you know, we're resisting it. But the wisdom of God comes to us. Yeah. That's what the poem goes. That's all right. And it would seem like to me that in this situation, that what, when we talk about systemic change and how the goodness seems to get in the way, we can't get to systemic change because we can't stand the pain. But this gift that Bobby used in that poem was that the wisdom of God breaks in. And when the tomb flies open, we don't go out to where we were on Palm Sunday or the Sunday before that. We go out in this wisdom of God to have systemic change. Yes. Well, you've said it better than I could. And I think, but I think, I think for what do you get to the wisdom of God? You have to have transcendent worship somewhere along the way. Yes. You have to have yeah. in, in before. Saturday, the Sunday has to be transcendent. Worship, not celebration. That's right, not celebration. That's true. But we, but, and and I, will, I will say, but we are in such a hurry to get to heroes that if you'll think about it, every, and, and those of us from the black tradition know, it's not long before after he hung on the cross, we get the earth coming on. Yeah. Yeah. And folks are leaning forward to wait to see when you get to Sunday morning without dealing with. Well, I just have one question, and I know I'm going beyond a few parameters, and I apologize. But having marched in the 60s and knowing how we felt about the old folks and that they had, didn't have the answers that we needed when we were 18 and 21, it was a lot of that going on. I'm now 70. I figure I have 20 years to raise hell. <laughs> so, go to it. Years. So, where do we go as an old person to make the contact with the young community that is now leading the way, as you said? And I think you hinted at it. But I sit here thinking, I've got to do something. I've got to make it real. And how do you do that? 
Well, yeah, well, that, that, that is the question. I, some of us are, well, everywhere, I think, if you can find a community, whether it's an organization or a church or a community that is already in the work of doing justice so that they don't have to look for street creds and waste time, or they have it. Um, it's a place that will draw young people because they might be angry at us, but they know that they need our wisdom and our support. They know that. They're not, they're not stupid, these kids. They, and not all of them are arrogant enough to think they know it all, is, is my experience. If I, if, I, if, I, if I may go back um, to Brittany and, and Ferguson and Starsky Wilson and St. John's UCC Church, when, when St. John's opened their doors to these kids who were flooding the city, and the school or the college where they have been promised that they could overnight said, no, we can't do this anymore because they didn't want to be associated with that. And Starsky said, well, I have a basement. And they came. And there was never, well, but you have to come to church. Nothing like that. But after that weekend and after the activities and what happened on the streets and so forth, they were all in church on Sunday morning. And that began a relationship. That young woman says, and I have the quote in the book, I had given up believing in God. And certainly she had given up believing in the church. But when she saw, ah, that's other than, I mean, you've, I would like to read the quote, but that's always the problem, right? <laughs> when, you, when you want to do that, <laughs> you want to do that, you can't find the quote in your own book. You look like, you look like the stupidest person on earth. <laughs> Um, and, 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 and she says, she says how the way in which he acted made Jesus real for her. The sermon that he preached made sense, not because he was so eloquent in all of that, which he is, but because before Sunday, she saw him on the streets on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. He was in jail with them. He went out. He, when he came out, he went to find money to bail them out. He gave them food. She saw Jesus in him. And so she was not so much overcome by this man's greatness as by the way she says, the way they could make God become real for her. That's... In that community, so if you were in Ferguson, I would say to you, that's where you have to go. So wherever you are, find a place because the young people of that place will seek out those places where they can make connections with. Um, and that's where, because they will need you. I mean, you know what you went through, but the great thing about from what I hear from you is despite all the setbacks and the difficulties and the pharaohs along the way, you still have your hope intact. You still have your faith intact. You still want to do And raising hell is the best way to praise God these days. You know that. So, so I, I, really do hope that, I really do hope that you find a place. Um, and and, 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 and when, you, when you are in the right places, I don't know how... I mean, sometimes you find them in the church or sometimes not outside the church. Sometimes you find them on the streets. Sometimes you find them in demonstrations. So the, if the churches had been on the streets on Saturday as churches, those young kids would have known. Ah, you see what I'm saying? I don't know whether we were there. That's the, that's the reason. People sometimes ask us, how come you always wore your clerical robes when you demonstrated? It's not because we wanted protection, because there's no such thing uh, with all these fascists around. There's no such thing as protection. They, they, they seek you out because you are the one 
who gives all sorts of ideas to these kids, so they will beat you up. My, I, no, I said I have a friend, um, a very close friend, uh, who, who on one of the marches for the release of Mandela almost lost an eye because he was protecting a nun that was in the first front row with him and they beat him with a whip uh, across his eye and he almost lost it. So, so, and he had his clerical, but it was so that people would see the church is here. And we knew that, that our worship of God in the sanctuary would mean nothing if our worship of God in the streets is not seen and recognized. And that's the point. So it's, it's not that you're doing something else. You're taking your worship out of the sanctuary into the streets. I wish I could spend the rest of the afternoon listening to Dr. Zizak, and I know you do too, but I promise you, you have a chance to have a time book and several of you to purchase the book, and I want to keep the promise. And also, we have a Holy Saturday Saturday yeah. that we need to prepare and, and go into. So I'm going to ask you to join me in thanking Dr. Buzak with your applause.